Hey everyone, welcome back. We're diving into the world of cardiology today and a huge shout out to London Heartbeats Z Academy in the UK for giving us the research paper for this deep dive. Yeah, they're awesome. It's a state-of-the-art review all yeah. about those uh, quirky heartbeats we know as premature ventricular complexes, PVCs, right. published in the June 2024 issue of the uh, Journal of the American College of Cardiology, Clinical Electrophysiology, mm -hmm. sells a mouthful. Mapping and Ablation of Premature Ventricular Complexes mm -hmm. by Enriquez and uh, colleagues. And it's a super in-depth look at a really common heart rhythm issue. So what exactly are these PVCs? Why should we even care? Well, think of your heart like a well-conducted orchestra, right? right? Each beat's perfectly timed. Okay. PVCs are like a rogue drummer just throwing in an extra beat, disrupting the flow. Ah, interesting. They start in your ventricles, those powerful lower chambers of the heart. Uh -huh. And while they often go unnoticed, they can sometimes cause, you know, noticeable symptoms or even point to some underlying heart problems. Like, you know, those heart hiccups. But they're not always a cause for concern, are they? Not always. When do PVCs go from being benign to something that needs a doctor's attention. Okay, so there are three main scenarios where things get a bit tricky. Okay. First, when PVCs are super frequent and cause annoying symptoms, mm. palpitations, chest discomfort, fatigue, maybe even fainting. Wow. If those symptoms stick around even with medication, then we might think about treatment. So if you're constantly feeling those heart hiccups, and it's messing with your day-to-day -day life. Exactly. That's when you need to step in and do something. Yeah, and that's where ablation comes in. So it's like silencing that uh, rogue drummer for good. Pretty much. Now, what about the other times when treatment's a must? The second scenario is PVC-induced cardiomyopathy. Okay. It's a condition where, get this, frequent PVCs weaken the heart muscle over time, affecting how well it pumps blood. Hold on, are you saying those extra beats, if they happen often enough, can actually damage the heart? Yeah, and eventually this can lead to heart failure symptoms. That's uh, that's a bit scary. But the good news is that ablation is super effective in treating this. By getting rid of those disruptive PVCs, we can often reverse the heart damage and uh, get the heart pumping strong again. That's good to hear. It's amazing how such a targeted procedure can have such a big impact on the heart's overall function. Now, you mentioned a third scenario earlier, one that could be uh, life-threatening. What's that about? Right. The third one involves PVCs triggering a really dangerous heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation, VF for short. Okay. VF is like an electrical storm in the heart, making it quiver chaotically instead of beating properly. That sounds intense. So the PVC basically sets off this electrical chaos. Exactly. VF is a medical emergency. It can lead to sudden cardiac arrest. Oh, wow. But again, ablation can be a lifesaver here. It gets rid of the trigger, reducing the risk of VF. That's remarkable how ablation can be both a treatment for bothersome symptoms and a life-saving intervention. So we know when treatment's crucial, but how do doctors actually find the source of these rogue heartbeats? Well, it's like a high-tech detective game. We use a bunch of sophisticated mapping techniques to find exactly where those PVCs are coming from. Okay. We start with the electrocardiogram, the ECG, you know, that test with electrodes on your chest. Yeah, it's like becoming a human circuit board. Right. Ah. But believe it or not, this simple test can tell us a lot about where a PVC is coming from just by looking at the shape and direction of the heart's electrical waves. So those squiggly lines on the ECG hold clues about where those extra beats are coming from. They do. What other techniques are used to pinpoint the source? To get even more precise, we often use something called activation mapping. Okay. Imagine this. We thread a super thin, flexible catheter, which has tiny sensors, through your blood vessels all the way to your heart. This lets us see the heart's electrical activity from the inside, finding the very first signal of the PVC. Hmm. Like pinpointing the epicenter of an earthquake. Exactly. That makes sense. It's like we're zooming in on that rogue drummer and finding out exactly where they're sitting in the heart's orchestra. That's a great analogy. But what if those PVCs are sneaky and you know hard to catch during the procedure? Ah, that's when we use pace mapping. Pace mapping. Think of it like recreating the PVC's unique fingerprint. We use the catheter to stimulate different areas of the heart and watch the ECG patterns. Uh -huh. When we find a match, bingo, we know we've found the culprit. Uh-huh. It's like playing heartbeat charades. Dang da. But what about people who are afraid of needles or, you know, not comfortable with the idea of a catheter in their blood vessels? Are there any non-invasive options for mapping? Absolutely. There's something called electrocardiographic imaging, or ECGI. 
Yeah. Imagine getting a 3D map of your heart's electrical activity without any needles or catheters. Now that sounds pretty sci-fi. Right. You just wear this vest that's covered in electrodes, and the system combines that data with a CT scan or MRI of your heart. So no needles, no catheters, just a high-tech vest. Yep, and you get a detailed 3D map of those electrical signals. That's incredible. Hmm. It's amazing how technology is allowing us to look into the heart's electrical system so clearly and without any invasive procedures. Yeah, it's really amazing what we can do now. So we've got the basics of PVCs down, and we know how doctors use these sophisticated techniques to find them. Now let's talk about the tools they use to fight those rogue heartbeats. What options are available to eliminate those PVCs once they've been mapped? Well, once we know where those rogue heartbeats are coming from, we've got a few weapons in our arsenal to get rid of them. Okay, let's hear it. The most common one is radio frequency ablation, RF ablation for short. Right. We deliver radio waves through that same catheter we use for mapping. Got it. These radio waves create heat at the tip of the catheter, basically cauterizing the tiny area of heart tissue that's causing the PVCs. So it's like a tiny highly precise heat zapper taking out those troublemakers. Exactly. It's amazing how we can target such a small spot in a beating heart. It really is. It's pretty amazing, and most people can go home the same day or the next back to their normal routine pretty quickly. That's reassuring. Of course, we keep a close eye on their heart rhythm after the procedure, making sure those PVCs are gone and there are no complications. Makes sense. Now, you mentioned RF ablation is the most common method. What are the other options? Like if using heat is risky in a certain part of the heart. Right. In those cases, we might use cryoablation. Cryoablation. Yeah. As you might guess, it involves freezing instead of heating. We use a catheter with a chilled tip to disable the PVC source. I see. It's particularly useful near critical heart structures where heat could be more risky. So it's like choosing the right temperature setting, making sure we're not... Uh, Overcooking anything. Ah, uh, exactly. Are there any other tools in the ablation toolkit? Another option is transvascular ethanol ablation. This one involves injecting a purified form of ethanol directly into the heart tissue. Direct injection, wow. Yeah, it creates a controlled lesion that eliminates the PVC source. Yeah. It's super effective for targeting PVCs that are embedded deep within the heart muscle. Fascinating how doctors can use different approaches based on where the PVC is and what it's like. Right. You mentioned earlier that some PVCs even start in the pulmonary artery. Can you walk us through the heart, pointing out these common PVC hideouts? Sure. Let's begin with the right ventricular outflow tract, or RVOT. It's a common pathway for electrical signals in the heart, kind of like a major highway. And for some reason, PVCs often originate here. So the RVOT is like a busy intersection where those extra heartbeats like to cause a traffic jam. Exactly. How do doctors even navigate this area during an ablation? Well, first, we carefully thread a catheter through a vein, usually in the groin, and guide it all the way to the heart. A long way. Yeah. We use fluoroscopy, a type of x-ray, to see its position in real time. Like a live GPS for the catheter. That's a great way to put it. What else helps doctors see the heart during these procedures? We also use a 3D mapping system. It creates a virtual map of the heart's chambers and electrical pathways. Wow. Like having a 3D blueprint of the heart, allowing us to pinpoint the PVC's exact location within the RVOT. It's like having a detailed roadmap of the heart to guide every move. Yeah. Now, you said RVOT PVCs are often benign. Does their location affect the success rate of the ablation? It does. RVOT TBCs tend to have the highest success rates, partly because they're usually harmless and pretty easy to reach with the catheter. So if those heart hiccups are coming from the RVOT, the ablation is likely to be very effective. Very likely, yes. What about those PVCs that start in the pulmonary artery itself? How's the ablation different there? That can be trickier because it's a more delicate area, closer to the pulmonary valve, which controls blood flow between the heart and lungs. Okay. We might need a different type of catheter or change our technique a bit to protect the valve. Like using a finer tool for a more delicate job. Yeah, something like that. Now let's cross over to the other side, to the left ventricular outflow tract, or LVOT. Okay. You mentioned it's like the RVOT's mirror image, but on the left side, how does navigating the LVOT compare to the RVOT? The LVOT is a bit more complicated because it has more structures, like the aortic and mitral valves. So navigating the LVOT is like driving through a city with more landmarks and detours. Uh-huh. Yeah, you could say that. Does this added complexity make LVOT ablations riskier? 
It can, because we're closer to the coronary arteries, the ones that supply blood to the heart muscle. Right. Damaging those would be a serious problem, so we're extra careful. Like working in a high security zone, trying not to set off any alarms? What are the techniques to minimize those risks? One key tool is intracardiac echocardiography, or IC. IC, okay. It's basically an ultrasound that uses a probe inside the heart to give us real-time images of the structures and blood flow. Wow, that's like having a tiny camera inside the heart giving us a live video feed. It's pretty incredible. Does ICE have any limitations? While ICE is super helpful, it's not perfect. Sometimes it's hard to see certain structures, especially if the patient's anatomy is a little different. So not perfect, but still a game changer for visualizing the heart during these procedures. Yeah, for sure. Now we've covered the RVOT, and LVOT, those busy heart highways. Let's zoom in on some specific landmarks within these areas, starting with the aortic valve. This valve is pretty important. Lynn. It's crucial. It's the gatekeeper between the heart and the aorta, the big artery that carries oxygen-rich blood to the whole body. So ablating PVCs near the aortic valve sounds risky, given its vital role. What do doctors do to minimize risks in this area? You're right. Ablating PVCs from the aortic valve is one of the tougher cases because it's so close to those coronary arteries. Right. One approach is to use a special catheter with a cooled tip. Wait, so we're using ice to protect the coronary arteries while we zap those PVCs with heat? That's playing with fire and ice. Haha, <laughs> that's one way to put it. The cooled tip helps prevent heat damage to the surrounding tissues, especially those arteries. We also use ICE to see the area clearly and make sure we're not getting too close to those arteries. Incredible how technology lets us do such intricate procedures inside the heart. It really is. What about the mitral valve? Are there any special things to consider when ablating PVCs from there? The mitral valve is another delicate area. Before we do any ablation, we carefully assess the valve's structure and function. So you need to make sure the valve is in good shape before zapping away. Exactly. What if the valve is already damaged? Then we have to be really careful. Right. You don't want to make it worse. No, absolutely not. And we also need to be mindful of the mitral valve's leaflets, you know, those flaps that open and close to control blood flow. Right. We don't want to accidentally damage those. Exactly. That could disrupt how the valve works. So what techniques are used to protect those leaflets during ablation? Sometimes we use a catheter with a curved tip so we can access the valve from a different angle, minimizing the risk to those leaflets. That's it. We also adjust the ablation energy and how long we apply it, being extra careful around those delicate structures. It's like each part of the heart needs a slightly different approach, using a specialized toolkit for each case. You got it. Now let's move to one of the trickiest spots in the LVOT, the left ventricular summit. Okay. What makes this area so tough to navigate? The left ventricular summit is right between two very important arteries, the left anterior descending artery and the left circumflex artery. Oh, wow. Ablating PVCs here requires a lot of expertise. It's like diffusing a bomb in a super sensitive area. Pretty much. How do doctors safely ablate PVCs from the left ventricular summit? One way is to combine different mapping techniques like activation mapping and pace mapping. This helps pinpoint the exact location of the PVC and how it relates to those vital arteries. Can you quickly remind us how those techniques work? Sure. Activation mapping helps us find the earliest point of electrical activation during the PVC, and pace mapping confirms that by pacing the heart from that spot and watching the ECG pattern. So it's like using detective work in a heart rhythm simulator to make sure you're in the right spot. Exactly. Now, you mentioned earlier that sometimes you have to ablate PVCs from inside the coronary veins themselves. Right. When does that happen and how is it different from ablating from within the heart chambers? Ablating from within the coronary veins, those blood vessels that feed the heart muscle, is usually necessary when the PVCs are coming from the heart's outer surface, the epicardium. So it's like taking a detour through the heart's own blood supply to reach those troublemakers on the outside. Haha, -ha, that's a great way to put it. It's a more complex procedure that needs special catheters and advanced imaging. Sounds pretty high stakes, needing a lot of skill and precision. It does. Now on to another tricky spot the papillary muscles. Okay. Those are the finger-like projections inside the ventricles that help control the heart valves. Right. That's right. They're essential for the valves to work properly. What happens when those papillary muscles start acting up and causing PVCs? Ablating PVCs from the papillary muscles can be really tough. They're small and they move around. So you're trying to hit a moving target inside a beating heart. That's like threading a needle on a roller coaster. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, it can feel like that. And to make things even harder, those papillary muscles are often surrounded by important structures like the chordae tendineae, those threads that connect the valves to the heart muscle. Exactly. We wouldn't want to accidentally cut those heartstrings? Definitely not. What special techniques are used to handle these papillary muscle PVCs? ICE, that tiny camera we talked about, is really helpful here. It yeah. lets us see those papillary muscles and everything around them clearly. So ICE helps you avoid those heartstrings. You got it. Sometimes we also use a catheter with a curved tip to reach those tricky spots. I see. And sometimes we even use a robotic system to control the catheter's movements. Robotic-assisted heart surgery. That's incredible. Science fiction is becoming reality in cardiology. It really is amazing. Now let's talk about another challenging area. Oh. The Purkinje system. Yeah. You call them the high-speed internet cables of the heart earlier. Right. What makes ablating PVCs from here so tricky? The Purkinje system is deep within the heart muscle, making it hard to reach with normal catheters. I see. And remember, it's close to the heart's natural pacemaker, the sinoatrial node, which controls the heart rate. So one wrong move could mess up the heart's natural rhythm. Exactly. It's a very sensitive area. What strategies are used to ablate PVCs from the Purkinje system without causing harm? We use a special mapping catheter that can pick up electrical signals from deep inside the heart muscle to pinpoint those PVCs. Okay. And when we ablate, we use lower radio frequency energy and a shorter ablation time. Makes sense. This minimizes the risk of damaging the pacemaker. So it's like using a lighter touch and being extra cautious in such a sensitive area. That's a good way to think about it. Now let's move on to the cardiac crux, that crossroads of important structures in the heart. Okay. What makes that area so challenging? The cardiac crux is hard to reach with catheters because it's at the back of the heart. We need advanced imaging like 3D mapping and ICE to navigate safely and avoid damaging nearby tissues. It's like using multiple navigation tools to make sure you're on the right track. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned earlier that the cardiac crux is often grouped with the infraceptal left ventricle. Why is that? They're close to each other, and sometimes PVCs can come from a zone that overlaps both areas. So it's like expanding the search area to cover both potential hideouts during the mapping and ablation. Exactly. And sometimes we have to ablate from several points within both regions to make sure we've completely eliminated the source of those PVCs. I see. We've covered the cardiac crux and the infraceptal left ventricle. Now, what about the perihesian region, the area around the his bundle, that electrical superhighway of the heart? What makes this region particularly risky for ablation? Oh, the perihesian region is like a minefield for electrophysiologists. We're working so close to the his bundle. Right. Damaging it could really disrupt the heart's natural rhythm, causing a dangerously slow heart rate. It's like trying to defuse a bomb while tiptoeing around a sleeping dragon. Haha, -ha, that's a good analogy. What techniques do doctors use to minimize those risks during perihesian ablation? We use very low radio frequency energy and a short ablation time so we don't accidentally damage the his bundle. And we watch the heart rhythm very carefully, looking for any signs of disruption or blockage. So you're being super gentle and extra vigilant. Absolutely. Now, let's move on to the tricuspid valve, one of the heart's four valves. Okay. What are the specific challenges of ablating PVCs from there? The tricuspid valve is always moving opening and closing to control blood flow, which makes it a tricky target to hit. Right. Plus, it's close to other important structures, like the coronary sinus, a big vein that drains blood from the heart muscle. So you have to hit a moving target while avoiding other sensitive structures. Yeah, pretty much. What techniques are used during a tricuspid valve ablation? We rely a lot on ICE to guide our catheter and keep us away from those sensitive areas. Wow. We might also use catheters with curved tips to reach the valve from different angles. It's like using a custom design tool for this specific delicate job. Yeah, you could say that. Now, you mentioned that sometimes you group the moderator band and the right ventricular papillary muscles together with a tricuspid valve. We do, yeah. Why is that? Because they're all in the right ventricle and they can all be involved in the same PVC problem. So it's like dealing with a whole neighborhood of potential PVC triggers. Exactly. Are the ablation approaches similar for these structures? They are, yes. Okay. We use those same advanced imaging techniques like ICE and specialized catheters to navigate safely. Got it. And when would cryoablation be the preferred method over radiofrequency ablation for these structures? Cryoablation is great when we're near delicate structures like the tricuspid valve or the moderator band. The freezing is less likely to cause collateral damage compared to the heat from radiofrequency. 
So it's about choosing the right temperature for the job, avoiding any accidental overcooking. Exactly. Now let's talk about one of the toughest challenges in PVC ablation, intramural PVCs. Right. Those are the ones that start within the heart muscle itself. What makes these PVCs so hard to treat? Inframural PVCs are tougher to reach with our usual ablation techniques because they're embedded within the muscle. So it's like trying to eliminate a target that's hiding underground. Yeah, kind of. What strategies are used to get to them? One approach is to ablate for a longer time using higher radio frequency energy. Oh. This creates a larger ablation zone that hopefully covers the whole intramural PVC. Gotcha. But we have to be careful not to damage the surrounding heart muscle with all that extra energy. It's a balancing act, getting rid of the PVC without harming the healthy tissue. For sure. Another approach is to use a different kind of ablation energy, like cryoablation or ethanol ablation. You mentioned ethanol ablation earlier. How does that work again? Ethanol ablation involves injecting a tiny bit of highly concentrated ethanol right into the heart tissue where the PVC is coming from. This basically destroys those abnormal cells, stopping them from causing those extra heartbeats. So it's like a targeted chemical attack on those rogue heart cells. Uh -huh. You could say that. And it can be really effective for those hard to reach intramural PVCs. Amazing how doctors can use different ablation techniques based on the location and type of PVC. Are there any new technologies on the horizon that look promising for treating intramural PVCs? One exciting one is irreversible electroperation, IRE for short. It involves delivering high voltage electrical pulses to the heart tissue. IRE, okay. So we're zapping those rogue cells with a high voltage jolt. That's the idea. And IRE is very selective. It targets only the abnormal cells, leaving the surrounding tissue unharmed. So a precision strike on those troublemakers. Precisely. It sounds very promising. It is. IRE is still being developed, but it has the potential to revolutionize how we treat intramural PVCs. It's incredible how cardiology is always advancing, with new techniques and technologies popping up all the time. Yeah, it's a really exciting time to be in this field. It really is. And it's all driven by the desire to help people live longer, healthier lives, free from those disruptive heart rhythms. Absolutely. Welcome back. We're continuing our exploration of PVCs, those extra heartbeats that can sometimes throw our hearts off rhythm. We've already taken a journey through the heart, exploring how they start, those tricky spots they hide in, and the amazing ways we treat them. Now let's shift gears and dive into the world of cutting edge research. Okay where scientists are constantly trying to solve the mysteries of PVCs. It's such a dynamic field, always changing, with new discoveries constantly reshaping what we know and how we treat them. So what's hot in PVC research right now? What are scientists most excited about? One area that's really buzzing is the role of genetics in how PVCs develop. Genetics? You mean some people are just born more likely to have those extra heartbeats? That's what the research seems to suggest. Interesting. Scientists have found certain genes that seem to increase the risk of developing PVCs, especially the ones that start in the left ventricular outflow tract, or LVOT. So those genes are like part of the blueprint for those rogue heartbeats, influencing whether someone's more prone to those rhythm disruptions. That's like a great way to put it. And if we can understand these genetic links, we could identify people who are at higher risk maybe even prevent them or create personalized treatments. Exactly, it's really exciting. Genetics is revolutionizing medicine in so many ways, giving us insights into disease risk and treatment options. Another hot area is the development of new ablation technologies. You mentioned a few earlier, like irreversible electroperation or IRE. Mm. What makes these new techniques so promising? IRE and other non-thermal ablation techniques, they're showing real promise for treating PVCs, especially in tough locations like the intramural region, the one within the heart muscle itself. So these new techniques could be safer and more effective than traditional radiofrequency ablation, which uses heat to destroy those troublesome heart cells. That's what we're hoping for. Fingers crossed. Researchers are also working on improving the accuracy and efficiency of mapping techniques, refining those 3D heart blueprints and live video feeds we talked about. So making those virtual maps even more detailed, those real-time images even clearer, allowing doctors to pinpoint those rogue heartbeats with laser precision. Exactly. The goal is to make PVC ablation even less invasive, more accurate, and lead to better outcomes for patients. It's amazing how technology keeps pushing the limits in cardiology. It's like watching a medical revolution happening right before our eyes. It really is an exciting time to be in this field. There's one more research area I want to touch on, the long-term effects of PVCs. Okay. 
We talked about how frequent PVCs can cause heart damage, leading to PVC-induced cardiomyopathy. Right. But researchers are also studying the impact of benign PVCs, the ones that don't cause symptoms. So even if those extra beats aren't causing trouble now, they might still be affecting the heart in the long run. Some studies suggest that, yes. But we need more research to really understand these long-term effects and if early treatment might help even those without symptoms. It's like we're constantly learning more about PVCs, peeling back the layers to see their full impact on heart health. And this constant search for knowledge is what drives medical advancements and ultimately leads to better care for patients. This has been a fascinating deep dive into the world of PVCs, covering everything from where they come from and how we ablate them to the newest research changing our understanding. It's been a really enlightening journey, and we hope you've learned a lot about these common heart rhythm problems. Before we wrap up, I want to say a huge thank you to London Heartbeat Z Academy for giving us the research paper that made this deep doc possible. Yes, thank you, London Heartbeat Z Academy, for your dedication to education and for sharing this valuable knowledge with us. And to our listeners, remember, knowledge is power when it comes to your health. If you're worried about PVCs or any other heart rhythm problems, talk to your doctor. They can guide you and help you make the best choices for your care. Stay curious, stay informed, and most importantly, take care of those incredible hearts of yours. Until next time, keep exploring the amazing world of science and knowledge.